Okay, hello everyone. We are on another live stream. We have Nate Nichols with us. Hi, Nate. Hi, everybody. Hi, Bernard. Thanks a lot for having me. No, it's so, it's so good to have you. Um, today, we're talking about making artificial intelligence work for people. And we will look at the role of data storytelling and natural language processing. And we will also explore what this will actually mean for the future of work. So I'm really excited. Nate, you are the, the chief scientist at Narrative Science. You are also the co-author of a book, uh, Let Your People Be People. And I believe you are an inventor of a few patents as well. Uh, yes, yes. I've, I've, I've had my whole career in narrative science, um, where I'm now chief scientist, got to uh, co-invent a lot of patents with folks, and wrote the book you mentioned, Let Your People Be People, uh, with, with my uh, co-author and co-worker, Anna Walsh. That's great. So how, how are you? How has the first half of 2020 been for you? Yeah, uh, it's 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 been really strange. Um, like I, I can know it has been for everybody. Um, there's been a bunch of really exciting things that happened. My, uh, you and I were just talking about this beforehand, but my, I think my wife found out she was pregnant in like the second week of lockdown, and so now we've got a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old at home, and another baby due at the end of the year. We we signed a, a our first. We bought our first place um, April first. We signed on that. Um, Congratulations! Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Sorry, say again. It's all happening during lockdown. Yeah, yeah. It's this weird, very like adulting uh, time of my life. It's all happening during lockdown. And so it's, we've been super fortunate. The, our close family has been healthy. Um, we've got family across the country and across the world, and everyone has stayed healthy. So it's this weird disconnect where, for, for me and for my family, we've been super fortunate. But obviously, there's, you know, so much, um, so much pain and suffering and anxiety throughout the world uh, right now. And it, especially in America, it's just a really sort of an unhappy time um, in America and sort of a stressful time. And so it's it's been weird trying to sort of reconcile both both parts of, of what's happening right now. Mm. And you, you're joining us from Chicago, um, where you are based, where narrative science is based. Um, maybe you can give us a, a bit of an overview of what you do for narrative science and a bit of your background, maybe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so narrative science, like you mentioned, is uh, based in Chicago, and the the technology originally came out of Northwestern University, which is a a, a big university here. Mm. And in narrative science, we're the we're the leaders in automated data storytelling. Um, and I think we're going to talk a lot more about data storytelling and what it would mean to automate that. Uh, but really briefly, we have our main product, Lexio, and it's solving for uh, for people who are underserved by BI dashboards or tools today. So. Every company is, has a ton of data coming in. They're doing a pretty good job now of holding on to it and uh, structuring it and then wanting people to make decisions and better decisions based off that data. Mm. And what we do a lot of times is they give somebody a dashboard and they say, OK, here's a, here's a dashboard with all the data. You know, Spend time in here, figure out the information, figure out the insights, get, get a good interpretation and use that to make decisions. And it's for uh, probably for me or for you and a lot of people uh, here on the chat, that's we can do that, right? We have analytics backgrounds. Maybe we have experience with these tools. We have the expertise, but there's a ton of people that don't. And so what happens is people who aren't analysts either, um, they need to spend a lot of time in these tools trying to figure out what's interesting and it's really hard for them to do. And uh, so because it's hard and it's time consuming, they they don't do it. <laughs> a lot of times we're, mm -hmm. we're humans, we like to avoid hard uh, time consuming tasks. And so, a lot of the companies we talk to have this dirty little secret they think is a secret that you know they have spent all this money uh, pulling together data they spent all this money on uh, tableau licenses or sort of building out these dashboards but no one actually looks at the data and we've mm -hmm. heard that we've heard that secret from so many organizations now it's starting to feel like this is a this isn't a real um, isolated secret this is a super common problem yeah and so with lexio what we're trying to do is instead of expecting somebody to spend all the time clicking through the dashboard, let the machine do that for you. And so Lexio, it's automated data storytelling product. And so it does a bunch of analysis against your data. It knows what topics are most interesting to you, which metrics you care about the most. So it can look for things that you should know about or questions you ask it directly. It pulls that together, it figures out why that's happening and figures out what that might mean for the future, structures that all into a story and then writes it in English. And so instead of expecting someone to have a lot of analytical expertise and spending time clicking through tools, 
the system can actually just write that story for you. It can write that data story for you. And so that's the that's the the company. We've been doing this for 10 years. As you mentioned, we've got a bunch of you know patents and customers, and our, our software writes millions of stories every year. And so that's that's narrative science. Um, and then for me in it as, as chief scientist, I'm 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 responsible for the strategic vision and value of the technology. So uh, part of that, it's a really, it's a super fun job for me. Uh, it's one of many I've had at Narrative Science, which is part of uh, what's helped it really stay interesting to me over 10 years. But with this role, part of it is spending time externally, talking with people like you and, and everybody watching. Hi, everybody, thanks for watching. Um, and trying to, uh, you know, articulate our vision for the future and the, the future we're trying to build and what we see coming and learning from everybody else who's also trying to build the future. And then the other half of that job is working internally uh, really closely with our engineering and product teams to make sure what they're able to figure out how we're actually going to deliver on that on that strategic vision, um, how we're going to get from where we are today to there, and, and making sure that we don't we don't stray too far from that from that path in the you know in the day to day of trying to get the next feature out to users or trying to triage some bugs or trying to put out a fire, you can lose sight of where we're going longer term. And so that's also part of my role is helping sort of keep the keep those torch fires burning and keeping us on the right path. Very good. It's a fascinating job, I'm, I'm sure, and a fascinating world to be in. I, I love uh, the this whole ability of machines being able to have conversations with people, write stories. It's one of the most fascinating areas of artificial intelligence for me. Um, you, you, you said said hello to a few people. Let me just pull in a few people who also say hello. So we've got Penny. Penny is a very loyal listener. She's saying hello to, to both of us from Coventry in, in, in England. We have uh, someone from Karachi in India. Um, we have Zara from Azerbaijan. Um, let me just go through. It's so nice for all of you to say hello. Um, Lena saying hello. Um, Sika here from Maryland um, in the USA. We've got Frederick from Spain. Um, we have Christina from Munich in Germany. Um, ne uh, uh, Nirja from uh, Cambridge in the UK. Um, we've got someone from uh, Morocco, um, from Qatar, Doha. It's amazing. So it's really good to see everyone on the on the on the on the live stream and as always this live stream will also be made available on my youtube channel where it's currently being streamed and will be available from tomorrow and we're also turning this into a podcast episode so if you ever want to listen to any of this again you can dive into that um nate you, you were on your linkedin profile you say making ai work for people um and I, I guess when, 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 when we talk about artificial intelligence, when I talk to people about artificial intelligence, people can be quite scared uh, about this. Uh, making it work for people is a great little slogan. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad the slogan worked for you, uh, Bernard. Uh, yeah, so, so like, like you said, there's a, there's a ton of interest in AI now, and there's just a lot of excitement and hype and energy, and it's, it's a super fun space to be in in the NLP space, especially like you mentioned. But there's, like you said, there's a lot of stuff that makes people squeamish, you know, and I think that's fair in a lot of cases, facial recognition things, um, you know, really super micro targeting ads or political messages to people. There's a lot of these things that are maybe technically super impressive, but are, they don't, they make us squeamish, right? They sort of give us the heebie-jeebies. It's not, we don't feel super great about them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other AI things that are, um, delivering a lot of value to business, but it's a lot around cost cutting and, um, you know, uh, uh, optimizations and making sure, I, I was reading yesterday about Prep manger how good they are at getting the right ingredients and the right volume to the right store, because they have all these really advanced machine learning models. And it's like, that's super cool and that's great for the business, but it doesn't, no one's day is really happier because, you know, just the right amount of macaroni got to the right Prep manger And so, when I think about uh, AI working for people and what, what we're trying to do is really is to make like a, a real person happy with AI. We're trying to make a real person's day. We're trying to make 
you know, Susan Jones is a, a marketing manager at a manufacturing company in Michigan. And she says, oh, thank God for this piece of AI. It saved my, it saved my butt today. Or it told me something I needed to know, or it, it took on some task that I hate doing. And now I get to have this machine do it for me. Or it caught something that I was about to miss. That kind of visceral response of like, oh, thank God for this AI is what, is what I think of when I, when I talk about AI working for people. And I think it's, um, yeah, because like you, it's just nice to be able to feel that value directly. And that there are so many ways that AI can get sort of, it's just sort of murky of who's who's benefiting from it. Are we, is this really for me or is this to gather data so you can sell ads better? Or there's this sort of, it's often not clear what the, what the sort of motivation is. And when it's, when someone can appreciate it, when they have that visceral sense of like, this AI helps me, it's very clear what the value is and the value is to them as the, as the user and as the customer. Mm-hmm. And that's, um, yeah, that, that's the space I really like to be in. And I, I get excited about the, the example that I, I use a lot is, is Iron Man where it's Tony Stark is absolutely, he's the guy, right? He's the, he's the heart of Iron Man. He's a real dude. He gets to use his experience and, and judgment and intuition and charisma and everything else as a human. And it's it's him and totally in control, but you know, having that AI in his suit and having that superhero superpowered suit is what is really extending his human capabilities, right? It's making him more human, it's making him more powerful, but he's always in the driver's wheel. It's always him making the calls and it's it's really AI serving him and you know, him in a way that he can appreciate. And that's that's sort of my North Star for some of this, is, is uh, thinking about Iron Man. And that's that's yeah, that's what we're trying to do, and that's the AI. I'm not, I'm not against, you know, there's a, I'm not trying to shut anybody down and, you know, people working on facial recognition or whatever right on. But for, for me, just a, a lot of my job satisfaction comes out of, of people directly, concretely um, being helped and appreciating something that I helped build. And so that's, that's really the space that I like to be in. Oh, what a wonderful way, way to be. I, I think if you, if you have this opportunity, it's great. And if you can make this link to actually make it, making a real difference. Um, what what yeah. I'm seeing in the real world is that the interest in in artificial intelligence has always been massive. We've definitely seen a, a really increasing interest in this field even before the pandemic. So I, I wrote my book, The Intelligence Revolution, uh, at the end of last year, and when when nobody knew about um, about the pandemic, and what I feel is that the pandemic has almost put a rocket under this, has accelerated it by many years. Is this what you see too? Yeah, yes. Um, and, and I think that's, I'm curious to hear your take on it, but I, I see that coming from a couple directions. And one is that AI research and work can basically continue unimpeded during quarantine, where there's there's so many things that are, are slowed down or, or halted. And obviously we've all had to learn to, you know, communicate more via Slack and Zoom and sort of do kind of, um, you know, basic remote work kind of things. But in general, the people working on AI are can just keep working on AI. And so there's no, there hasn't been really sort of an, any inherent slowdown. No. And then I think, so that's, you know, that's what has allowed it to keep going. And then I think there's also additional pressure that, you know, we're seeing in our business, but I'm sure others are as well, where it's just the way people can feel work and society changing is making it, is making it more amenable to AI, where we have, uh, not, not to keep harping on dashboards, but those work best when you can have people sitting around agreeing on what they're seeing and coming away with that same interpretation. And that uh, it didn't scale super well when everybody was in an office, but it, it kind of worked. And now it's it's really hard, right? And so now all of a sudden you want something, uh, something like like uh, Lexio is more valuable because it can um, you don't have to sit a bunch of people around a dashboard it can write for you. And there are other places I know of, you know, online gaming, like how important it is to, to match people together and to do like spaces in VR. And there's just so much, the the way the world is changing, I think is, is making it more sort of AI, uh, AI friendly, or sort of there's more places where AI can, can provide value. And so there's already a lot of momentum and it's just, you know, gasoline on the, on the AI fire. Mm. So talking about AI and, and, and data driven storytelling, then, can you give me some example uh, examples of how companies can use data driven storytelling in their own world? Yeah, so so I think that's yeah. So when I think about um, ways data storytelling can be used, I think it's I, I think that highlights a, a misconception potentially about data storytelling, and that 
that's the idea. When people hear data storytelling, it can sound sort of um, it can sound like a technique or like a like a move you can do. You can do you could put together a dashboard, or you could put together an infographic, or you could do data storytelling. And it's really it's not that's not the way it works because uh, data storytelling is is happening all the time. Uh, and everybody, it's happening all the time everywhere, whether we want it to or not. And that's because storytelling is happening all the time everywhere, whether we want it to or not. This is how stories are how we understand the world, right? This is when we look at a situation, when, when we interpret it, we come away with cause and effect. We come away with characters. We come away with a little model that helps us make predictions for the future. We come away with hopefully an understanding of how we could um, either make something like that not happen again or happen even more. And those are all those are stories, right? And that's it, it's it's our biology that that makes us so story centric. This is the way we evolved. This is where early humankind invented Zeus and Thor because you know they observed thunder and lightning and they were so desperate to to explain it and to be able to control it in some way or at least influence it that they invented you know guys on mountains throwing lightning bolts. So storytelling is happening in our, in our minds at least, if not explicitly, and when when you hear a piece of data and it and it you have an understanding of it, you have an interpretation of it, and you either from hearing a piece of data or looking at a dashboard or looking at a chart in an article, if you have an interpretation, you data storytelling has happened somewhere. It may have happened, you know, implicitly in your mind. You may have read a, a really well constructed data story, but it's it's happened somewhere. Mm. And so the question is less, you know, for me at least, is where can data storytelling be applied in a company? And it's more, since it is happening, like, what are you going to do about it as an organization? Are you going to, are you going to have data stories be created by um, partnerships of analysts and business people working together? And there's a bunch of analytics expertise and a bunch of business expertise, and they come together and spend some time and come to something really great. That can work really well for um, you know for big problems. It's hard to scale for sort of everyday um, everyday things. You can do dashboards and put those up and have people click through the dashboard and they come up with some some data story in their mind. Uh, you can do something uh, like like we do and have an AI generate it. However, you sort of get there, and every company will eventually probably use some you know each of these in different areas of their business. Well, but it's really. So do you have some practical examples of what companies are actually doing? In, in what kind of settings are they using it? Where, where have you seen it really benefiting businesses? Yeah, so, so um, you know, a lot of, when we think of, of taking uh, executives through a, how a product launch went, right? That the way that often looks is you pull together a deck, there is, there is data in there, but you're also, you're also sort of connecting those data points. You're weaving those things together. Um, and so that, that's really when it becomes a story. You know, I think there's, there's this idea that if you have, um, if you just sort of have bullet points and it's language, then it, it counts as a story, but it's like, oh, that's the same. You know, you just translated the chart to the bullets and someone has to read these bullets and still do the interpretation. And that, that interpretation is the storytelling moment. Yeah. So companies like things, typically it's bigger, it's sort of more strategic things. It's less common. It's where it, where it really matters, where that people feel like that story really matters is where the intentional explicit data storytelling happens today. So, you know, meetings for, uh, for execs or pulling things together for customers or clients. That's a lot of the places where um, where, where people are, are actually spending the time to pull together real explicit um, explicit in the sense that it's concrete and actually written down um, data stories today in companies. Okay, and now we can use artificial intelligence for this, in particular natural language processing. Um, can you give us a a flavor of how natural language processing actually works and what it is? Uh, yeah, so um, so natural language processing is is NLP as like we mentioned, AI is, is really exciting in general right now. NLP is, a, is especially exciting um, the last couple of years. And it's all, NLP is whenever a computer does anything with language, uh, with human language, that's NLP. Natural language is the sort of computer science jargon for the language that humans speak. So if a computer is doing anything with language, it's, it's doing NLP. And so the ways, I'm sorry, what was the, that's, oh, how, how, how is it done? Yeah, how, how does it work? 
So I, yeah, I guess so we're used to our uh, having conversations with Alexas. We're used to having interaction with chatbots. They're all examples. Uh, so how, how does this actually work in practice? Yeah, so there's um, there's a really sharp distinction in AI between applications and approaches. And so NLP uh, applications are things you can do with AI. Approaches are ways you can do AI. So NLP is an application, which means there's a ton of different approaches for doing it. Um, but in general, you can sort of bucket them into structured and unstructured approaches. And so for um, for unstructured approaches, uh, and there, there's 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 different reasons and sort of um, depending on what you're actually trying to do and depending on your specific use case, you would pick a more structured or a more unstructured approach. And so like an unstructured approach, a good example is um, the, the type ahead feature in Gmail. I don't know if, if anyone has used Gmail or, or Google Docs in the last six months to a year, when it suggests the next few words for you, that's it's doing NLP, right? It's, it's looking at what you wrote, is trying to predict the next few words. If, it, if it's confident in its prediction, it suggests them for you and you can just hit tab and autocomplete. And that's that's using an unstructured approach. So if, if you've heard about deep learning, big you know massive neural nets, that's um, unstructured approaches are sort of in that space. So that that's using some deep learning system. It's scanned a whole ton of emails from you and from other people. And it's trying to sort of, it's just trying to predict based on everything it knows, it's trying to predict what the next few words are. Yeah. And, Unstructured approaches like that are are really good when you want a ton of coverage. So they they want it to work for every email, ideally in every language, but they they really want you know super broad applicability. So that's important for them. They don't really care a whole lot about accuracy. Like they they want they want the suggestions to be good, but they don't they don't have to be good. When when a suggestion is wrong, as long as it's not bizarrely wrong, you know, as long as it's not you're not offended by how dumb the machine is to suggest that. Then, then it's it's fine when it gets it wrong. So it, there's very low cost to being wrong and big upside to being right. And they also don't they don't really need to understand what you're saying, right? Google isn't trying to understand. Hey, you're sending a resume. Hey, this is a follow up uh, meeting. This is a this is a breakup letter. They don't they don't really care. They're just trying to predict things. And mm -hmm. so these unstructured approaches are great when you want a ton of coverage. You can relax a bit on accuracy, and you don't really need to understand. And then you flip all that to get the, the structured approaches. And um, you know, Siri, as you mentioned, is, is a great example here where there's a ton of questions that Siri doesn't answer. You know, she's you can't chat with Siri, she's not a chatterbot, you can't sort of have a conversation with her. You can ask her to do things, which she may or may not be able to do. And she has a few canned responses to, you know, kind of make her feel chatty and fun. But basically it's it's an interface on top of a bunch of capabilities the phone already exposes. Same with Alexa and Google Assistant. And so for them, they're they're willing to sacrifice on um, how applicable it is. They're, Apple's okay saying there's a bunch of questions Siri can't answer. You can't ask her about her day. They're okay. They really want it to be accurate. Mm -hmm. They want you, if you ask the weather forecast, they really want to give you the right weather forecast. You know, you can. I could probably open up an email and try typing in and see what Gmail does. What if I say tomorrow the high will be, and it might suggest something, right? And that the something it suggests will probably be a plausible temperature. It won't be a billion degrees, but it's not going to be the right temperature, right? The that the, those emails don't know. They've been trained on a bunch of previous emails. They don't. Have, they have no idea what the actual weather forecast is. And so Siri cares a lot about that. So she's trying to be accurate, or the program is trying to be accurate. And they really, she really needs to understand what you're saying. She needs to map you to the right, to the right intent, to the right task. And so, if you, if you, if you can relax on coverage, but you care a lot about accuracy and you care a lot about understanding, then you'll take one of these more structured approaches that you can, um, you can open them up. You can understand a little more what's actually happening inside, and they're easier to, to debug and tune. But you, you sacrifice the, the super broad applicability you would get with these unstructured, more deep learning approaches. Very good. Um, so have you got any really, what, what are your favorite examples when, when, when you want to excite someone about natural language processing, not necessarily just data storytelling, what are the kind of examples you, you would bring to the table and say, this is, this is how cool this all is? Yeah. So there's, um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff there. There's, I would say there's probably two um, two areas outside of data storytelling that I'm I'm personally really excited about. One is um, 
I don't think there's a real name for them, but they're basically virtual therapists. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a company called Wobot, and there's a lot of other um, a lot of other I think products in the space that they're they're trying to be a virtual therapist, right? And I, I know Wobot in particular is uh, I think it's based on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a pretty popular school now, and it has positive. You know, Stanford did real studies on it, and it actually has shown um, genuine benefits to people. And so the idea of uh, I'm just, I'm a big, I had a wonderful therapy experience a few years back and I'm a big fan of, um, uh, of therapy. And so the idea, um, you know, especially now we've been talking about COVID a little bit where every, there's a ton of anxiety in the air, there's a ton of um, sadness in the air and there's a ton of difficulty of sort of getting out of the house. The idea of having um, a virtual therapist that can talk with people and can, you know, can super patient, it's always available. You can talk with it as long as you want. All these sorts of, um, limitations that come from having a human therapist can can go away. And I don't, you know, I certainly don't think, you know, human therapists will be extinct in 10 years and it'll all be AI. Like that's that's not the that's not the way I see the world going for for therapists or for anybody else really. But it being able to take on some of that work and you know be with people late at night or be with people for uh, who couldn't afford a therapist, that kind of stuff I think is um, is a really exciting uh, application of NLP and definitely fits in that that making AI work for people sort of mode I've talked about where it can actually, you know, it can function as a friend, it can function as, um, you know, as a real companion and helper for people. And I think that's that's powerful. And then the other one I'm really excited is about uh, is gaming applications. There's a, there's a super cool game called AI Dungeons that's all based on uh, GPT-3, which is this, the, the mother of all unstructured NLP models that came out uh, a few few months ago. I'm sure a lot of people here have heard of it, and seen the seen the press around it. But the the game itself feels like a sort of like a Zork game where you're you know you're navigating this kind of maze and you're picking up different items and solving puzzles. But the entire game space is all created for you by the computer, by the AI, and so you're you kind of end up telling the story together with an AI. And I think it's that's um, yeah, it's super cool. I, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I don't have much time uh, these days to play video games, but my, my heart is still, uh, I'm still a video game nerd. And so things like that in this space, the idea of having, um, you know, a bunch of video game companions you can chat with in the future and can talk back with you and like all of that kind of stuff. I think there's going to be a lot of, a lot of super cool video gaming applications that are, that are move us. Yeah, that move us beyond like the graphics are getting better. Like that's, that's fine, but the graphics are pretty good now. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing other innovations in, in video games. And I think NLP will, will be a lot of them over the next you know, three to five years. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, there's so many super exciting applications of this whole conversation of AI, where I, I think healthcare, as you say, therapists is, is amazing. And what I found interesting is that some of the studies have actually shown that people um are even more open and more honest when they know it's not a real person they're speaking to which is, is wow. yeah yeah the like i know the um just anecdotal anecdotally the the fear of being judged by by a therapist is a very you know they're professionally non-judgmental that's part of their that's part of their job description but it's it can be hard for people to trust that absolutely and so yeah so coming back to then um data storytelling um if you look across your customer base, for example, and say, how, how are they using it? What what are they doing with our product? What are your favorite use cases there? What 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 examples, again, showcase the what, what data storytelling can actually achieve? Yeah, so so for us, our the 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 favorite thing that I hear from our customers is that they get time back in their day. And especially now that means that means time back in their their family's day a lot of times you know it means they get to come out of the back office and spend more time with their with their kids or with their spouse or with their roommates and that's because it's just there there are so many people and, and i didn't really appreciate this problem i was you know i came straight out of undergrad i went into grad school i and then my first real job was narrative science and so it's and i've, I've started as an engineer and then moved into product and so i just i, I never really understood how much how much report writing there is, how much sort of fruitless clicking around there is, and there's and how much anxiety there is around around data and people feeling like they they're dumb and everybody gets it but them, or 
they're not a numbers person. And so they're never going to wrap their head around this. And it's it, it just the, the anxiety and, and, and guilt that people can feel because they think like they're the only ones who aren't in an ad spending an hour in a dashboard and point out all these amazing insights all the time is really, it's really a bummer for me. And, and it's like, it's, it's just not, it, it, yeah, I just, I, I hate when people take on unnecessary, you know, when they feel bad and they don't have to, right? There's enough, there's enough things in the world right now to feel bad about that we should also not be taking on the secret shame of thinking you're the only one who doesn't like your dashboard. And so for us, it, it's, we have plans to sort of move Lexio so it can do, it can help you run board meetings and it can do, you know, share out to customers. You can put together PDFs and you can do all these really cool things. But for us right now, we're really solving for, you know, the manager or the the, the new employee who is who's really just trying to know, learn from the data and make better decisions from it, but is otherwise just trying to do their job. They're trying to close more deals. They're trying to do a better job marketing. They're trying to get more features out to the customers. And so giving them time back to do that and saying, look, you don't have to feel bad about that you don't understand this thing. This is a thing people aren't good at, right? We don't, humans aren't good at numbers. Numbers are a new invention for us. We're, we're probably good at like one, two, and many, but otherwise this is all new and we don't, we don't have the biology. Our brains aren't set up to support this. And it's, it's amazing that we have science and math and we, it's like amazing these, these structures we built. And it's, it's crazy that our brains can actually execute these algorithms and we can solve complicated math problems because it's, it's so far removed from, you know, from what our, our brains were really built to do. And so having, acknowledging that, making that explicit, and then having a thing that's good at numbers handle the number part so people can focus on the stuff that makes them feel good and makes them feel valuable. That's the, that's the kind of stuff I love to, I love to hear from customers. Yeah. And I, I, I agree. So what I see a lot is in, in businesses that, people are scared of numbers they are overwhelmed by numbers we are now living in a world in this big da big data world where we have more data than ever before uh, lots of my clients probably use less than one percent of the data they already have because they don't know the data exists they don't know exactly how to analyze it they don't know what questions to ask and i i think this is where conversational interfaces can really help where I can simply ask a question, who are my most profitable customers? And you can have the, if you have a system in place that knows where to find the data, how to analyze them, even better, turning it into a story, that is super powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and knowing, the, the thing that I love is, is also knowing the, um, knowing the questions that are sort of implied by your question. You said, who are, who are most profitable customers? And having a system that can say, you know, we, you sort of, let's say, you know, a basic thing would be, you know, sum up all the profit accrued from every customer, sort sort by profit and pick the top three and report those as your three most valuable customers. But knowing that like, if a human did that, they might see like, wow, there's really, there's really two clusters, right? And so when you're thinking about customers, there is a valuable cluster, cust uh, there's a valuable cluster and there is a cluster that's not very valuable. And so what I should really be telling Bernard about is about this cluster. and. The actual details of the customers aren't in there, aren't aren't that important. But trying to pull out what's what's the same across them, you know, why are these guys so much more valuable than the others? Because that's really kind of the question behind your question, and so that's that's some of the space we're in, and we, we had there's a lot more to do there. But that thinking of the question behind the question, and it it doesn't become just a literal interpretation of like, oh, which which database query should I execute in response to Bernard's question? It's like what is he what is he getting at and what does he care about mostly and what are the follow up questions he typically asks and what are things that he didn't ask but he should have and I know that as an AI that knows what he cares about and I'll I'll bring that to his attention too and so that's the you know that's where we're going with data storytelling automated data storytelling which is yeah it's fascinating and and for me it's, it, it takes away some of the bottlenecks that we see in organizations because what we put in place a lot is is some hand holding where um, that we create functions that sit in between the data science team and the business team to then help bridge some of those conversations. And and I guess what you're saying is that AI can now do a lot of that. Yeah, and I, I think the what the the world that that we see coming is there's sort of there's kind of two lanes for a lot of these things where there's a lot of you know you mentioned those sort of intermediaries and for 
for really strategic problems, for um, for ad hoc things, for areas where there's a ton of analysis and you really gotta dig in, you're gonna spend six weeks getting to the bottom of something. Those intermediaries are probably maybe just the right people to have there, right? Those are more, it's a, it's a bigger process to get to that answer. You need more analytics expertise. You need to kind of align everybody. And there's a whole sort of process around that. And, and so the way I see people being used in these kinds of situations in the future is those more ad hoc things, those more strategic problems, the, the deeper problems, which are, you know, the ones that people like to spend their time on and the ones they, they went to school for and they, you know, they feel good about, they feel like they're vibing with the team. And then there's sort of a, a different lane for the the more mundane stuff, the day-to-day -day stuff, the the questions of like, hey, has this data been updated? Or, hey, this looks like a big increase. Is that okay? Like all of that kind of stuff, which is, you know, it's kind of basic, but it still chews up a ton of everybody's time. That those are places like where AI can can help, right? And so we with, with things like Lexio or, or in general AI that that's really working for people, it's taking those tasks that are that feel low value to us, that we don't we don't really feel like we're applying our expertise, we're not really being our best, we don't need to be our best. Let, taking those off their plate, letting the machine handle that kind of scut work, and then freeing up more space to do the more interesting, invigorating strategic work. Absolutely. The, the other areas where I see this being used very effectively is in, in journalism to some extent, um, where if you have to analy analyze um, the the earnings reports, for example, of companies. This is something you can very easily give to an AI to now turn into a really engaging story and article. Um, yeah, well, we've we've written a lot of those in the sort of earlier yeah. versions of narrative science. There's a lot of there's a lot of earnings earnings reports out there that have been written written by our software. Yeah, and you're exactly right. It's so it's so data driven, and in particular, those are very those are very consistently structured. There's a pretty well understood format for how those are going to look and how they should look. And in other areas, like there's um, places where the government demands that things look a certain way, right? If you're a bank and you detect some suspicious activity, there's a form you have to file with the federal government. It has to have all these things filled out. It has to have this information mentioned. It has to have all of this kind of work. And it's a very, it's just super structured and super consistent. And so that's that's another place where people are using, um, you know, sort of data storytelling, certainly natural language generation to to really fill those out because it because the structure is so consistent. Yeah, and and sports, I guess, is the other area reporting. Yeah, we we write we write a lot of little league games uh, every every year, and that's it's super. Yeah, for us, it, it's kind of like it's silly. We we laugh about it, but we always smile about it too because when we talk about making AI work for people, it's this it, it's a product called Game Changer. It's a it's literally a little league tracking app, you know. So it's parents in the stands watching their seven year olds play uh, baseball, but then it writes this lovely story about the game, and it writes it for everybody on the team. Um, it can write for to sort of highlight different players, or it can make you know the losing team. It can still make them sound really good. They fought really hard, but they weren't able to quite come back. And it's you know it's explicitly writing stories for parents and for for grandparents and for kids, and that's. It, it's 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 it, yeah it's one of my favorite customers we have because it's just so the value and the the visceral smiles that people get from that is is so concrete and it's it's it, it, there's no sense that it was written by a computer it sounds really just like a sports writing it talks about you know does it come from behind victory or is a blowout or is a pitcher's duel between these two seven year olds <laughs> learning learning to pitch and it, it sounds so human written and it it just it. It matters a lot to the people who get it. Each one of those articles is probably read by four people, but those four people, it's written about their kids and their grandkids, and so they love it, you know? And the amount of stories our software has written that have ended up on refrigerators is, is super heartwarming to me. Yeah, and I, I think this whole idea that you can now customize stories to individuals. So if you if you work in a, in a company and you're writing a, a earnings report or a performance report, this is usually one type of report you're producing. In the future, you can very easily customize this for each person that is receiving them based on what you know they need. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, what I used to um, say in grad school was, my, a lot of my grad school work was around automatically generating news shows. So it would take what you're interested in and it would pull together, this was you know, 10, 12 years ago, so it pulled together a little flash video for you about people discussing news that you were interested in. It would pull everything you know, scripted out automatically. 
And there, and it, the same analogy still works here, but it's we're moving away from a broadcast model where you know a broadcast model you make one TV show or you make one video and you try to share it with you know ten thousand, a million, ten million people. To it's an it's a narrow cast model now. You write a million stories and you send them to a million people each but each story just goes to exactly one person and all of a sudden because you can scale it's like oh it's the computer's writing the story like we can just have it write it for everybody right and it, mm -hmm. these things that would just be you know way too time consuming and murderously dull for a person to do it's computers are you know they're like a perky puppy they're they're happy to come in and write a million story million versions of this um you know earnings recap for a million different investors and that it's really kind of strange that they can scale that way, but it, it's super useful and it's super exciting. And the challenge then will be, become how do we, and this is something where we're starting to deal with the narrative science where we're, we want to write just the right story for, you know, for you, Bernard, and you're, you and I mo both may get a story about sales last quarter for the company we're at, the same company, but your story is very different than mine because of, you know, we're in different roles, we're on different teams, we have different focuses. And so that at one level, that's super valuable because it's like, oh my God, this story is exactly written for me. You know, I'm the only audience here. On the other hand, it starts to be like we are potentially starting to diverge, right? And so you and I are now getting kind of different stories. And we and I say, like, oh, I, did you did you see that thing in the story? And you're like, I didn't, that wasn't in my story. And it's like, oh, well, I thought we were both kind of getting the same story, but not quite. And so there, there's definitely um there's things we'll have to sort of work through there to understand when when we really want to personalize it for somebody and optimize it for somebody and when we're either just putting everybody in their own bubble and everybody gets their own story that makes them sound like a hero and everybody's happy but no one's actually together which is a good outcome so trying to balance that will be will be an interesting thing going forward yeah i i, I completely agree i i think especially when you talk when, when, when you're talking about corporate performance data, I think you need to control a bit more the corporate storytelling. What I actually find at the moment is where we all try to democratize data and give everyone the ability to analyze data themselves, they sometimes come out with completely different stories. So I think to some extent it's important to have some control over that. Yeah, and, and that's, um, yeah, absolutely. That's, in, in general, that sort of mode has been a, um, has been a, has been sort of a, or a yeah, that mode has been a, a mode we've been in for a while where we've used in the past where basically what, what our software does is write the first draft of something and then it goes to a human who is really responsible for, you know, either signing off on it or adding additional context or, um, you know, calling things out. And so it it becomes like a, a big uh, a big lift for the analyst or the, the person who would write that report initially, but there's still a chance for for them to sort of put their cor corporate voice on it or whatever they whatever context they need to add before they're comfortable sharing it out that's a that's sort of a way we've done in the past because of because of exactly the reasons you mentioned very good um you mentioned that you have two children and one one on the go um that will hopefully arrive when did you say december 26 december 26 which is also my wife's birthday so yeah. we'll see if oh, both of them end up with christmas birthdays yeah very busy December for you. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, the whole end of the year is going to be crazy. But yeah. So, um, given that we're talking about lots of automation, automating parts of what people do, how do you see this impacting the future of work? Um, any? I always say I have a positive view of all of this. I see this as actually creating a more human world, giving some of the work that humans shouldn't really be wasting their energy on and, and doing something better. But what, what's your vision of the future of work? What you, you kind of just blew up my spot there, Bernard. It's very, <laughs> it's very similar. Yeah, I, I see. Um, yeah, I see, I see a similar world. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with um, this idea of tasks versus jobs where, you know, we talk about you know, for, for people who aren't that you know, we, we sort of worry that a robot or people talk about a robot taking the job and that, that that's a, the newest version of automation taking jobs, which is the concern that's been around since, you know, cotton mills um, back in the day with the Luddites. And what happens typically is, is automation takes away tasks. And when you think about a job, it's a collection of tasks. And so I, th I think I, I, I saw a list of like from 1950, it was the most, like the hundred most common jobs in the US. And from 1950 and in 2020, all of them are still real jobs, except for toll booth collector. 
like toll booth collector is the only job that's actually gone away in the, the last 70 years. And that's, that's because it's a single task. If you're a toll booth collector, the task of taking money and giving a ticket or punching the card or pressing the button, that's, that's what that job is. It's that one task. But for, for most jobs, it's a bunch of different tasks. If you're a bank teller, sometimes you're working with customers, sometimes you're you know, redirecting them, you're kind of upselling them, you're getting the cash, you're answering questions. All of those different things are tasks that a bank teller does. And AI might start doing some of those tasks, but it, it won't do all of them. And so what happens, what happens tends to happen is that the job doesn't go away. It just it sort of shifts, it evolves. Some of those things that you used to do, you don't have to do anymore. If you think about uh, you know, cleaners in a hotel, They'll, they won't be vacuuming in a few years. There will be a, some souped up Roomba that comes out and vacuums rooms, but there's still gonna be a lot of other work for them to do. And maybe they become more customer facing. They start chatting more with the customers or uh, you know, bringing things to the rooms. And so it sort of shifts to be a more customer facing role, something like that. I don't know exactly uh, where that'll go, but in general, that's, that's, how we, that's what happens with automation. And I think that that same world is, um, the same thing will happen with AI where there's, you know, so I'm, uh, probably a lot of people here that used to spend, and I used to, when I was in grad school, I spent a lot of time writing screen scrapers. There weren't a lot of APIs then, so you wrote something called the screen scraper that can open up google.com and type in the search query and then gets the results and walks through the HTML and picks out the URLs and does things with them. And it, it's brittle and it's not any fun to do and it's kind of a pain and they break all the time. That's the way it was, and but that was part of what I had to do. I needed data for for my project, and now there's a lot of really great AI that pro, uh, products that help with that. And you sort of tell it what you want, and they figure it out, and they they work a lot better. And so that that task has now been automated by, by AI, but a lot of the other things I did have not been. And so that's that's why I'm um, that's why I'm excited about the future. We have to uh, we have to get through the next uh, year or so, uh, and then I'll feel a lot better about the future. Um, but that's that's not AI's fault. But yeah, when I when I when I see the um, when I see the world that's coming, and I think about you know what what jobs or careers my kids are going to have, I think it's it's going to be working with AIs in a lot of places. It's going to be doing the tasks that are that are still sort of out of reach for AI. Those things that are that are more creative and more collaborative and uh, more novel, and there isn't a bunch of training data to sort of help an AI do it. Those are the tasks that I see being more common uh, because AI has taken on a lot of the other stuff. Yeah, I, I, in one of your recent talks, you talked about the fact that AI will make us more creative, more open, and and empower us more. Um, yeah, yeah, and it really for me, it's the it's we we've spent a lot of time, and I think we're we're starting to appreciate this more of how much we've contorted ourselves to 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 get computers to work. Right, we have to. We have to sort of do so much work to ourselves. We have to have so much training, so much expertise, because what the computers can do is so valuable. And the only way to get at that is through through programming or through writing these crazy formulas in Excel or through you know building these these dashboards. And so we've really we've sort of contorted ourselves to to get the computer to work so we can get the value out of that. And I think it's been us it's been us going to the machine, right? And we do the work and it sort of tells us something and we're, we're very grateful for that. And we say, thanks for the insight and we go back. And I think the world I see coming and to me is a much more, is a much more human stance is no, we're, we're the people here, right? We, we built these machines. It's crazy to us that we built them. And now in a lot of places, it, it feels like we're serving them, right? So it's, let's build them. Let's, let's keep the things that make us special, the things that we're good at. And it's the computer's job to figure out how to communicate with us, right? We're not, that's, we, we, we're, we're, we built it. We should not have to be doing all this work to get value out of it. It should be providing that value to us. And so I think when I, when I think of someone sort of in that stance and expecting the computer to work with them and expecting, you know, to work with the computer, it's a more, it's a more human stance. They, they, they spend their time on more, on more social, more creative, more collaborative things, um, and less on trying to get really gritty and get the logic exactly right, or you forgot to close a parenthesis and now the dashboard is down. You know that kind of stuff is uh, it's really crazy, and it can get I can be sort of I can work myself up about it. It's offensive, you know. This is crazy. It's like dehumanizing and it's denigrating to us as people to have to do all this work. And so I think that I think that'll that'll shift in the future. I, I guess the, the concern lots of people have is that I, I completely agree in, in the long term that would be good. But in the short term, I think there will be some pain transitioning because there are lots of people that might not feel that they've got the skills to 
actually do a higher value job and be more customer facing and be more creative and and if you empowered everyone it might scare them too <laughs> Yeah, that and that's that's definitely um, yeah, absolutely. And I and I you know especially now I don't begrudge anyone having anxiety about the future or you know their career. And that's that's partly why um, what I try to do when I have these kind of conversations is to is to be is to be reassuring because I think that I, I genuinely think that's the right that's the right stance. And it's I want I don't want people to think like AI is this. Um, you know, it's a scary thing that's just being, um, it's being done on the, you know, being done in the uh, in the valley somewhere and sort of being inflicted or in China somewhere and it's being inflicted on the rest of us and we don't really have a say in that. Mm -hmm. And it's, we, there are places where we do need, you know, I've seen there's recent legislation around facial recognition and I'm very, um, you know, very excited about that. And we need, there are things we need to take on societally. And there are things where it's, I, I think it's, it's almost like a confidence issue. It's a, it's a issue of like, no, we, people should feel like they are good at their job and they were hired for a reason and they're, they're wanted at work. And a, a machine that comes along and takes the, the boring parts of their job away or the parts that they don't want or aren't particularly good at and don't really care about, that that's a, I want that to feel like a liberating thing, like a freeing thing, because I, I think that's what it is. But like you said, I know there's, um, I know there's definitely a lot of anxiety around this and especially now I, I completely understand where that's coming from. But I, I think in the long run, it'll, and I don't think the long run, I think is, you know, it's the next three to five years or something where we'll really start to um, to see these changes in a, in a positive direction. I agree. What What's your future prediction then about um, AI and, and maybe data storytelling, natural language processing? If you could say these are my my predictions of what is going to happen. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you two uh, for, for data storytelling. I, I think that'll that'll just become ubiquitous. Like that'll be that'll be the expectation for how data is is or how people understand data. Mm. It'll be um, you know for us for us we're doing a lot of it in the business and that's in the business world and business intelligence that's great. But thinking about um, you know your your bank bank statement that comes every month and is like mine right now is a line chart and it's I have no it's like okay like I you know I have I have, I have a PhD I have some analytical experience and it's like this line chart is so sort of bare and I, I don't want to take the time to figure it out there's a bunch of context that's missing and you think about you know healthcare data uh, your personal healthcare data you think about your kids education there's so many places now like you mentioned there's just so much data being gathered and uh, we're using one percent of it and I think that's you know, the value of data is exactly equivalent to the value of the action driven by that data. And so there's so much data now, but we're not seeing much value from it. And that's because people aren't understanding it. And so I think, I, I definitely don't understand a lot of the data that, that's presented to me. Mm. And so I think it'll just be once people start start having experience with this and they see, you know, they see the power and how much actual understanding there is, then I think that there will just become automated data storytelling everywhere. And I don't know, um, I don't know what that'll look like. I don't know if that'll be embodied in something like Siri. And if you'll talk to Siri about your bank account and she'll be able to access that somehow, or whether you'll go to your bank and chat with a, a chat bot or whether it'll be something like Lexio or whatever, that'll probably be solved in a lot of different ways. But I, the idea that someone should look at a, a part of a pie chart that was like mailed to them about their energy usage and do something useful with that information is, I think will just totally go away because it, it, it just it doesn't work right and i think now that better solutions are becoming available for that i, I think it's i think it'll become ubiquitous and yeah. uh oh for for the other prediction um for around nlp but probably around ai in general like i, I talked about the structured and unstructured approaches mm -hmm. and in general like deep learning is a big unstructured approach and there's been a there's been a ton of success around that lately and that's awesome it's driven you know big advances in translation and facial recognition and uh, text prediction and all these things and but it and so that's the unstructured side the structured side has a lot better understanding it, it sort of has can have higher accuracy it, it actually knows what it's talking about mm -hmm. and i think that in the future the the way this will sort of continue to advance is some is some hybrid model of the two of those and it's it's just like people have we have an unconscious side of our brain where you know i can't tell you exactly why i'm choosing the words that i'm saying right now i can I can kind of tell you what I'm thinking about, but each individual word I don't really have access to. So that there's like that unconscious part, but there is a conscious part as well. And I can tell you why I said something and I can do, um, 
Yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can tell you why I said something. I can refer to things earlier in the conversation. I can be really explicit. I can do math. Like I can do these sorts of, these more structured things. And so people can do both of these. So we're some kind of hybrid system. And so, and I think the way, the way forward for AI is gonna be some, some hybrid system as well. I don't, um, I don't know what that system looks like yet, but it's, it's not going to like deep learning. We're not done, right? It won't just be we're, next time we'll build a model that's even bigger of deep learning and it'll eventually be smart enough to do anything. It's no, there is that, there is that semantic side, that knowledge side, that structured side. And then the the hard part is how do we how do we combine them in a way that that keeps their strengths and doesn't sort of um, but but mitigates their weaknesses. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely, and and the, I think I completely subscribe to both of those predictions as well. Um, okay. In in and and I guess to some extent this can make data storytelling more creative as well. We already have the the ability that machines can now not just tell stories from data but they can create fictional stories they've written books they can create poetry yeah. I think there was a let me just pull in a, a comment here from Victor he was saying um can machines be creative how creative can they be uh, become in the future do you think AI can be creative and he had a follow-up question saying could they potentially accomplish more than than than, than, than we as humans. So it's an interesting dialogue. And I had a fascinating discussion with Marcus Dusatoy, who wrote The Creativity Code, um, uh, an Oxford professor. And if anyone wants to see this, this conversation, it's on my YouTube channel as well. On And, and the, the, his entire work is, is around machine creativity. So it's a fascinating topic. Do, do you have any views on that, Nate? Nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's super, well, it, it's interesting for me because um, you know, like I, like I talked about, we, we care so much about the numbers like being accurate, right? We, we really want our sentences to always be correct. Mm -hmm. They're always grammatical. So we're, at this point at least, we're not, we're not solving for creativity. We're solving for like, more for rigor and correctness. And so we, and we're, when we take a structured approach to doing that, on the unstructured side, there is a ton of creativity there, right? If you, if you, if you look into GPT-3 much, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's writing whole things. There's been uh, short films. I forget what it's. Uh, it's the guy from. Um, that's the show, The Valley, Silicon Valley. It's the guy from that. Uh, the main actor from that did a movie, like a 12-minute movie that was written by an AI. Yes. There's been a bunch of um, music is being created by AI now. I saw that there's just going to be like YouTube and that kind of background music is just going to be like, yeah, an AI will create it. You don't have to worry about licensing things. Exactly. And so. It, it, you have to kind of parse creativity, you know, and what exactly do you mean by that and mm. that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think there is, computers can absolutely be creative. Um, and I saw in the question, there was an idea of like better creativity, I think it was used. And that's, that's like a super interesting idea, I think of, you know, better or worse creativity or, or what that means. But it can, it has the potential to do sort of like we talked about where it's really narrow casting things, right? So it can be like, are we going to be in a world in the future where I'm the only person watching this TV show, but I love it because Netflix is the AI wrote a TV show for me. It casts virtual actors that maybe it looks like the actors are my, that are my favorite. It's reproduced their voice. And this is like my dream show based on what Netflix knows about me. Like that'll, that'll absolutely be a thing that happens. Um, and there might be parts that don't, you know, maybe quite make sense or there, there might be sort of wonky edges, but that's that's a world that's coming, and so I, I think, yeah, um, creativity will, and computers being creative, it, it it feels like a question now, and I think it'll be one of those things in a couple of years, or you know, maybe five, ten years, it'll, it'll, it'll stop. It won't be a thing people worry about or kind of think about anymore because it's maybe we don't still know, like depending on how you define creativity. But in the meantime, I read the super interesting article or the super funny joke that an AI wrote, and so. I'm not really worried about whether that counts as creative or not. I I care about that I I laughed a lot or I enjoyed this show. Like that kind of thing I think will be will be what's coming there around creativity. Absolutely. One question, oh sorry, Nida uh, <laughs> Nida is asking how can we get our hands on on the software to to do something? Right. Yeah, I I love I love that question. We have a, we have a free online demo at narrativescience.com. Uh, there, it's, it'll be very obvious when you come to the site. It's the name of the company, narrativescience.com. We have uh, free demos of Lexio. 
And there's also, um, looks like we're running out of time here to plug, plug my book uh, very quickly. It's a free download on the website as well. It's called Let Your People Be People. And it's all about um, how you can use storytelling to, uh, to transform your organization and really, um, really highlight your employees and help them be, um, be more successful and be more human. And it's a totally free download. Wonderful. This is a, a, a great place to end here. I could carry on now. This this hour has disappeared so quickly. I could very easily carry on for another hour. Maybe we need to schedule a, a, another conversation. At some uh, anytime. Time. Great. Thank you so much. As I said, uh, anyone, please let me know what you think about our conversation in your comments. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, Nate can have a look at the questions. I will have a look at the questions. Anyone, any questions we haven't answered, we will do our best to, to have a look at them. And as I said, if you want to re-listen to this conversation, you can head to my YouTube channel or any of my previous LinkedIn lives with lots of fascinating people. I've got some super exciting LinkedIn lives coming up over the next two weeks. So follow me on Twitter or connect with me on LinkedIn and you will always know when I'm going live. Thank you very much, and I will see you soon. Thank you, Nate. Awesome. Thank you, Bernard. Take care, everybody.